Madame la conseillère fédérale, Monsieur le conseiller d'État, Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, permettez-moi de vous dire une très cordiale bienvenue pour cette conférence débat qui nous donne le plaisir d'accueillir d'éminentes personnalités sur une thématique qui nous intéresse tous très vivement. Brad, it's good for your French. Euh, <rires> qui nous intéresse tous euh, éminemment, puisque la digitalisation est un des avenirs de notre monde, sinon l'avenir euh, qui nous impactera le plus durablement. Et euh, sur une telle thématique, euh, la Genève internationale est non seulement bien placée, mais doit se placer encore mieux pour euh, en traiter euh, tous les aspects relatifs à la gouvernance et tous les aspects relatifs à l'impact social que euh, ce processus euh, euh, rapide euh, en une accélération peut comporter. Et c'est pour ceci, c'est pour cette raison que nous sommes très heureux d'accueillir cette table ronde, précédée d'une introduction par euh, Monsieur Brad Smith, euh, président de Microsoft et par ailleurs euh, ancien étudiant de l'Institut, puisqu'il y a étudié le droit international avec sa femme Cathy au milieu des années 1980, en venant de la Columbia Law School, où il est retourné ensuite pour terminer son diplôme avant de faire la carrière euh, euh, très prestigieuse que vous connaissez, de General Counsel de Microsoft, puis depuis euh, 2015 euh, de président. Euh, Brad Smith, avec euh, son idée de Geneva Digital Convention, euh, contribue à sa manière à renforcer la place de la Genève internationale dans le domaine de la digitalisation et c'est donc avec le plus grand intérêt que nous l'écouterons. Merci, Brad. Well, thank, thank you. I, I first want to say what an honor it is to be here with such an extraordinary group of people who are doing such important work for the world. Uh, when I was a student here, Uh, the rule was you needed to understand French, but you could speak English. <laughs> I'm going to continue in that habit. I started as a student. And I'll, I'll just speak for about 10 minutes, and then I think we'll have a very interesting discussion with a wonderful panel and uh, a real conversation, which is, I think, the real goal of the evening. The question, as you can see behind me, is can Geneva make digital collaboration a win-win? I hope so. I think the world needs Geneva to address the issues that digital technology is are creating around the world and find a path forward that will serve the world well. I always like to start by reminding all of us of where we've come from. And I think especially when you have the opportunity to speak in Geneva, That is especially important. It is remarkable to me to see how technology has evolved, not just over years or decades, but over centuries, and to see what that has meant for the challenges and what it has meant for Geneva. It really was in the 1800s that technology started fundamentally to change the face of the battlefield. Bullet bullets were hollowed out. Artillery became longer range and more powerful. And ultimately, it was in the late 1850s on a battlefield in northern Italy that the world took stock of the horrifying aspects of what technology had created. And thankfully, it was because of a group of individuals in Geneva that the governments of Europe came to Geneva. And in 1863, they entered into an agreement that created the International Committee for the Red Cross and rules that were designed to protect combatants from the horrors that technology had created. Of course, technology did not stand still. It continued to advance in all kinds of ways. People learned to fly. The combustion engine changed life around the world. But weapons became more horrifying still. 
People invented dynamite, and then they invented chemical weapons, and then we saw the horrors of World War I when technology was on display yet again. People again came to Geneva, and of course the League of Nations was founded directly as a result. And despite, unfortunately, all the lessons that humanity had learned, we still failed to grapple successfully with the problems of the time. And I think in many ways, it's always worth reflecting on what happened in the 1930s. Technology had turned a biplane into a bomber. And as we saw a new plane of warfare, namely in the air, people hoped that governments could come to Geneva in a disarmament conference and ensure some order, even some sanity. And of course, as we all know, the world failed. But after World War II, people came to Geneva yet again. And in 1949, I think in one of the great diplomatic triumphs of the 20th century, the ICRC brought together governments and persuaded all of them to agree that they not only had a moral commitment, but would accept a legal obligation to protect civilians even in times of war. It gave birth to international human humanitarian law as we know it today, a field that is sometimes breached but keeps people safe, that literally saves lives because it exists. So here we are yet again in a new century in Geneva yet again. And technology is continuing to race forward. And you won't be surprised to hear that for somebody like me who works at a company like Microsoft, every day we are excited about what we think technology can do. It is altogether likely that in our lifetime, if not just the decade ahead, artificial intelligence will help us cure many forms of cancer. Artificial intelligence will help us solve some of the most vexing problems of the planet, even the problems that ail the planet. As we're putting AI to use to address the world's oceans, biodiversity, climate change, and the like. And let's face it, we need all the help we can get. And yet at the same time, we are seeing a new plane of war. If the 20th century brought us war in the air, the 21st century has brought us war in cyberspace. It is, interestingly enough, a form of war that takes place during what is supposed to be a time of peace as we increasingly live in a moment in history when more nation states are using digital technology to attack each other. And the irony in part is that in contrast to the principles of the Fourth Geneva Convention, governments are sometimes attacking civilians and civilian infrastructure, not as collateral damage, but by design. In 2017, on a single day in May, the North Korean government unleashed what was called the WannaCry attack and disabled 300,000 computers in more than 150 countries. The National Health Service in the United Kingdom had to close a third of its hospitals. Never in the history of warfare had any government managed to attack 150 nations in the course of 24 hours. And yet, just six weeks later, we saw the Russians unleash what became known as the NotPetya attack on the nation of Ukraine, disabling more than 10% of that country's computers leaving mothers in a position where they could neither withdraw cash from an ATM nor use their credit cards to pay for food because the attack had disabled so many parts of the nation's network. And that, unfortunately, is in some ways the tip of the iceberg because what we've learned since is that starting in 2016, we have seen determined efforts to use technology to disrupt democracies around the world, to attack candidates and political parties and think tanks that are some of the pillars of our democratic institutions, to threaten the future of voting by probing 
whether it is possible to disable voting machines? And unfortunately, the answer today remains yes, they can. To use technology to exploit the social media that we all rely on every day and to sow disinformation into political processes, especially at key moments in time. And so fundamentally, the question is, what are we going to do about it? I think the world needs Geneva and the diplomatic community that works here to play a leading role. It was this that led us in 2017 to call for what we called a digital Geneva Convention. In other words, principles that would protect civilians on the internet in the 21st century the way the Fourth Geneva Convention did for all of us in 1949. And as we've readily acknowledged since, of course, the first step should be to build on what we have already. This can't be an exercise in starting with a blank piece of paper because a blank piece of paper would actually take us backwards rather than forwards. The world can build on the United Nations Charter. It can build on the Fourth Geneva Convention, and it can add to it from there. We do need some new ideas as well. We need to fill in the blanks and the rules that exist today where there are gaps. And today there are some gaps, including, for example, some of the issues relating to the protection of elections and voting and democracy and democratic processes. But more than that, we need to recognize that there is something different, that there is something distinctive about this fourth plane called cyberspace. Unlike land or sea or the air, it actually is often private property. It is created and it is operated typically by technology companies. And then it includes all of the things that we own ourselves. It includes the pockets in our phone, in the phones in our pockets. It includes the laptops on our desks. And hence, if we're going to be effective in addressing these issues in the 21st century, we're going to need not just multilateral initiatives like we saw in the 20th, we're going to need multi-stakeholder initiatives as, as well. We really do need to bring together governments and civil society and business and tech companies to take the steps that are needed together to keep the world safe. We need to do all of that around the world, but I would argue that we most especially need to do that here in Geneva. It's why we've been so supportive as a company in taking new steps, in helping to build the foundation for new NGOs, new people and groups that will be part of this community, as you're going to see in the weeks ahead. Ultimately, keeping the world safe is just one of the steps we need to take. We need to ensure that technology is disseminated broadly that everyone has access, not just to the internet, but access to the internet at broadband speeds. That everyone has access to the skills that will be needed to fill the jobs that will be created. That we take new measures to protect people's privacy, both from government surveillance and from misuse of data by businesses and the tech sector itself. In short, the world needs a bold agenda to address these issues, and it needs a bold agenda that brings people together. I think that's what we're starting to see emerge around the world. It's what we saw last year in Paris when we saw now 65 governments, more than 500 signatories come together to endorse the Paris call for trust and cybersecurity. It is what we've seen from the United Nations and the Secretary General's initiative. It is this kind of step that we have the opportunity to talk about this evening, and most importantly, to build on each and every day in the years ahead. In some, our view is we need to act with a sense of urgency because these issues don't get better with age. The problems just become harder. And yet, at the same time, we need to act with a long-term vision and commitment because for the students who will start at this institute this fall, these issues will be part of their lives for the rest of their lives. They will change, they will evolve, but they're not going to go away 
for all of us. They're part of our future. So thank you. I look forward to the conversation this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Please have a seat. So uh, I'm Miret Zaki, uh, economic journalist, and I have the pleasure uh, to moderate the panel. So I will now ask Mrs. Doris Leuthard to join us, and Amandeep Singh Gill. Mrs. Doris Leuthard is a former president of the Swiss Confederation, and Amandeep has been supervising, co-supervising the UN report on uh, the uh, digital independence, interdependence, which Brad, I think, uh, very much uh, also uh, uh, made reference to uh, in his speech. So, can we please start with a, a little round table where each of you tells us about what, in your views, is the most pressing issue in the digital interdependence age? Is it privacy issues? Is it cyber wars? Is it uh, education and the, the, the addiction, digital addiction of, of the young people with tablets? Is it uh, hate speeches on, on internet? What is the most pressing issue? Doris, please. Good evening, everybody. Um, I think it's difficult to say, uh, to have a, well, uh, Priority one, two, three, Very personal because it's all interlinked. <laughs> your, your feeling really about yeah. it. Well, I think it's what, what Brad a little bit said, politicians are too, too slow. <laughs> uh, technical development is so fast that we are not in a situation to understand. Uh, and we don't know how to regulate. And so the gap between orientation, regulation, uh, control, also ethical behavior, and leaving them in a, in, a, in, a, in a room where they can maneuver themselves is every day bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. And when we want to have confidence, trust in these technologies, we must act. And that's why we made the report, and that's why we started today this Swiss digital initiative that we can together, using the time until we will see a regulation by good initiatives, concrete projects, to build trust for citizens, consumers, that we accept this technical development. So I'll jump on your mention of the Swiss digital initiative for the people who don't know uh, wh what it is about. It's, it was today, earlier this morning, at the Swiss, uh, the Four Seasons Hotel in Geneva. Uh, you gathered with uh, 30 CEOs and uh, experts and uh, politicians. So what were the conclusions, really, uh, the concrete conclusions? Uh, is there a, are you going to start um, a, a new... Uh, uh, are, you, are you going to build a center for uh, digital integrity or something like that? We heard about this. Is that true? Um, I would not say a center for <laughs> integrity, but uh, we've seen there are a lot of reports around, a, a lot of recommendations, but so far not, they, they are not implemented in the business area nor in academic uh, area. And uh, the report we made for the UN Secretary General, uh, uh, one element we are missing is the architecture of these new technologies, yes. which can be in, the, in Geneva. And the other mm -hmm. thing is, how can we build trust and what, what principles, values uh, count in this cyberspace? And this Swiss Digital Initiative is uh, a platform where we have exchange of business people like Brad with all his experience, other companies, with academia, with NGOs, with the UN organizations and to uh, uh, launch such projects. Is it going to meet regularly? Is it going to be a, a rendezvous, uh, a regular rendezvous that uh, where you're going to... Uh decide about governance, about regulations, mm -hmm. discuss now, it. Uh, well, you experts, said it's a platform. So. Yes, experts now uh, created these principles. They will be improved yes. until January and at the World Economic Forum in Davos. We plan mm -hmm. that all these partners can sign up, that they will follow these uh, principles, this ethical behavior mm -hmm. uh, in their business models. Okay. And we then start with concrete projects, how we going to implement these principles in practice. And this will be a steady uh, work for this foundation so we will create, so that we can put Switzerland and Geneva the on the map of digital 
uh, governance. Okay. What about the fourth Geneva Convention, which Brad mentioned? Is it going to be uh, uh, modified in order to include the issues of digital interdependent cooperation? Well, I think it's governance? good when we have different initiatives. Mm -hmm. They have. Uh, we, we 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 should work together. We have the initiative for the diplomats. Uh, that's something different, but uh, very welcome. Yes. It's in the same direction. There are many but maybe we have to discuss then if we can uh, do everything under one umbrella or if we start with these different initiatives. But close cooperation is guaranteed. Okay, we'll come back to the cooperation issue. So, Amandeep, uh, tell us what is the most pressing, pressing issue for you in the digital risk uh, digital threats that you can see, right. uh, and then I'll ask about how we, we can cooperate, really. For me, the most pressing challenge is missing out on the tremendous opportunity that digital technologies offer for transformation of uh, our economies, uh, for inclusiveness, for development. Uh, so if we do not manage the risks, or if we focus excessively on the risks, uh, and the downside, then we risk missing out on the opportunity that is there. Uh, so for me, that's uh, perhaps the most pressing issue. And frankly, if you look at it from a global perspective, that is what is on the minds of people in countries such as China, India, a lot of countries in Africa. Mm -hmm. The focus on risk, which is legitimate, is uh, a higher uh, of higher salience in Europe and in North America, but there is a world out there that's looking at digital technologies from the perspective of opportunity and promise. Okay, I see you have a liberal view about that, not uh, too eager to regulate and put constraints, but rather uh, seeing the opportun opportunities, the business opportunities, okay? But the, the, I mean, you've co-supervised the, the, the yeah. report, the UN report, right? The report focuses much more on governance, regulations, but you'd you know, rather our, not make too much of that. Well, I mean, the regulation is important, and our co-chairs, uh, uh, Melinda Gates and Jack Ma, put it very well that you need guardrails and you need common rails. So guardrails so that things just don't go off track, uh, hurt people, etc. But common rails so that uh, entrepreneurs, both social entrepreneurs, economic entrepreneurs, can in innovate, can create value, can create jobs, can solve uh, real problems. Regulation has a place, but it has to be smart, it has to be agile, and it has to be done in this collaborative, uh, multi-stakeholder way, where society, social organizations, government sector, and the private sector have to come together, have to put in place regulation, but then have to have the agility to accordion it. As risks escalate, then you tighten the policies. Mm -hmm. But if the risks that people are worried about do not come about, then we should have the flexibility, the agility to accordion the policy away from that tightness. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Brad, what's the bigger threat from uh, digitalization, do you think? Well, I think it's interesting. I've built on what both of you have said. I think it's a remarkable time in which we live, and it's a time of contradictions in many ways, because when you think about what's going on around the world, uh, there's more nationalism and there's more populism than I think it's fair to say any time since the 1930s. Uh, we see you know, many countries and governments pulling inward, um, and yet we're not living in an economy of the 1930s. Um, macroeconomically, the last eight or nine years have been a strong period of economic growth, and not just a strong p period of economic growth in one or two places, but frankly, in most parts of the world. So what's going on? How do we explain to ourselves why there is so much anxiety, so much angst, when the economy is doing so well? And when you listen to what people are often arguing about in many countries, including mine, the United States, People are arguing about trade, they're arguing about immigration, they're arguing about income inequality, they're arguing about what in effect are the effects of globalization. But all of these things that everyone is arguing about in some ways are symptoms of a time of enormous technological change. 
And as you start to peel back the layers of the onion, one thing you do see in many countries, let alone the global north or south, is that there are some communities that are benefiting from technology, but there are others that are not. You don't actually have to go far from a major American city to encounter a rural community or county where very few people have access to broadband. And without access to broadband, it's almost impossible to attract more jobs or more investment. And in the same way, we see some people getting access to education in computer science and data science, but many other people that are not. And when you really study the demographics of who is getting access to these new, new skills, you see that it reflects the same fissures in society that everyone worries about. Mm -hmm. Or you can now walk down the street of a major city that is experiencing enormous technological growth Buildings are going up with you know, tech companies moving in, but being pushed out are lower income people who can no longer afford to live mm -hmm. in these places. Right. Yeah. And so I think what really worries me among other things mm -hmm. is that we don't spend enough time to understand the technological forces of our time, the opportunities and the challenges, because perhaps we're so focused on the symptoms that we're not looking deeper. Well, precisely the report, the UN report, is, uh, insists very much uh, on inclusiveness um, and facilitating affordable digital access for the, the majority of the, the, for the poorest even. Uh, but isn't it a utopia? Because actually, the digital market is very much concentrated in the hands of uh, big multinationals, of the GAFA, not to name them. And uh, how can this be uh, really done without some government intervention, uh, because uh, it's a liberal market. Uh, everyone can access uh, according to their revenues, to their means, to their education. So if you don't intervene to, to include more people, and, and that needs state regulation. So isn't it utopic to talk that much about inclusiveness, that we can make digital uh, access for everyone possible? Uh, so far, we haven't really made uh, economic well-being accessible for, uh, for everyone. So how can digital well-being, digital access be, be done? I, I think our conclusion was uh, through a year-long research, visits to different places around the world and discussions within the panel, that inclusiveness is the best framework we have. Uh, and inclusiveness can be driven by these common rails and guardrails, creating these uh, um, platforms where uh, innovation happens, problem solving happens, but also providing the safety and the security so that people don't fall off, don't get excluded. Uh, connectivity as such, you know, whether it's broadband or simple internet connections, is not enough. Half the world is still not connected. But if we just think in terms of connectivity, plugging everyone into the internet, that's not going to do the job. It has to be creation of demand. So whether it's digitally enabled financial services, uh, the kind you've seen with 300 million uh, opening bank accounts and getting access to digitally enabled finance in Southern Asia, or e-commerce platforms in China, or it is the new emphasis on health, agriculture and other areas where data can drive insights, where data can in fact drive down long-term costs. 10% of the world's GDP is spent on health and in the US it's a big problem for competitiveness. So those are the kind of issues that we need to focus on and there you're right, you know, governments have to be strong. But we have to get rid of this myth that somehow the private sector controls this, that this is a few companies that, because we focus on few aspects, devices, and some <coughs> forms of data, we think Microsoft, Google, Alibaba, Tencent, you know, they, uh, tremendous values being created digitally for small, small and medium companies, for individual entrepreneurs. We need to work uh, with that and in fact allow startups and smaller companies the space to grow and maybe look at them not being gobbled up too quick, quickly by the gaffers. Let's stay on, <laughs> Let's stay on the political uh, issues a little bit more. Um, Doris, uh, I, I find that the cooperation between the main player, the key players, which are the GAFA, and maybe there are many others, but the, the concentration is uh, 
between the hands of the GAFA and governments. This is where the, all everything is being going to, to play itself. It's between the states and the, the main players, the main digital players. And uh, these discussions, we had them in Davos uh, last year and the year before about can data be shared by private players uh, for the public good, for the public interest. I am a bit skeptical that this can happen uh, readily and uh, how, how can this be done? Because data is the new gold. Everyone's fighting to keep them, to control them. They have a value, they have a market value. So uh, I'm a bit skeptical that uh, government can access them and I even wonder if it's not too late for governments to catch up with this. Allow me first to say also something to infrastructure because this is also a government thing. Uh, Brad mentioned their broadband infrastructure. And I think here, in every country has to decide, does the investment the private sector or governments? Is this basic infrastructure an investment for all? And, you know, we, we, we changed also in our diplomacy aid for development. Uh, uh, we, we changed a little bit that we invest not in classical infrastructure, but in digital infrastructure. So this helps a lot uh, uh, to integrate and giving access for a lot of people because the infrastructure is here, is available. Uh, I think when it comes to data, yes, it's difficult. Uh, we discussed uh, uh, also for, for a long time in the panel, how can we give data as a value. Uh, that's also a, a critic against the, the, the tech uh, gi mm -hmm. giants we have uh, with this new uh, policy from, from Europe, for example. You, cost, you just can say yes or no, you accept or you don't accept. And if I want to use these applications, I have actually no choice. I have to accept Right. the new standards, exactly. and I give my data because I want to use this app. Right. Um, that's uh, uh, quite an issue, and therefore I think we must have this conversation. Mm -hmm. In the report, it, it's also a chapter when we think uh, these data are a common public good, because mm -hmm. uh, there are data which must be offered to our citizens for free, which are mis must be uh, uh, also um, uh, accessed by everyone, especially also in, in the research areas. You perhaps are most advanced because you are used that your scientific data are open. Yeah. Governments are also used. We have a lot of data within uh, the Swiss government in other countries as well, which we which we stay open, which are access to everybody. And then comes come, come, we are coming to uh, more um, sensitive data right. uh, where we have to find uh, 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 handling a, a way how we can uh, allow companies to make a business. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but then I would like to know what they do with my data, if it's anonymous, if we can intervene or mm -hmm. not. And these are all questions we have to uh, deepen up. And with this initiative, we launched that this could be a way with principles, with guidelines for companies as well, for governments, how we can deal with these issues. Because if we have nothing, <laughs> everybody makes what he likes and that's not uh, safe enough and mm -hmm. that's not, so we don't create tr a trustworthy framework. Yeah, which is more or less the current situation. So Brad, what do you think about cooperation between a big the company, big data companies and governments? Well, Is it I, in the interest of the companies? Yeah, well, it, it depends on what business model a company wants to pursue. Uh, the, the first thing I would say is, um, I think we're all going to find ourselves needing to learn a lot more about, I'll call it, the economics of data. Uh, when you think about artificial intelligence, the first thing you learn working with a computer scientist or data scientist is there is never any such thing as too much data. You know, the key to perfecting an AI system, to, vet, to developing a better algorithm, is to have a larger and larger data set. Um, so, you know, there's one vision of the future which is somewhat pessimistic. It says, look, you know, the success is going to go to the first movers and the biggest tech companies who have the largest data sets, then they'll have the strongest AI system, and they'll just have this 
return to scale, and you're going to have an enormous transfer of wealth from everybody else in the economy to those companies, and frankly, from most parts of the world to either the west coast of the United States or the east coast of China. And that's not a future that tends to excite people other than those who work in tech companies on the west coast of the United States or the east coast of China. So, so what do you do? Well, you know, there's two other factors that are just worth thinking about. The first is, unlike gold or oil, we do get to create data ourselves. Humanity creates this resource. And in fact, we'll have 25 times as much digital data on the planet as the 2020s begin as we did in the year 2010. So we're creating more data. That is one good thing. The second thing is data is fundamentally different economically from, say, oil or gold, because economists would say it's non-rivalrous, meaning if one factory uses a barrel of oil, no other factory gets to use that barrel of oil. But data actually can be shared. It doesn't need to be hoarded and used by a single entity exclusively. So what we're going to need to do is develop approaches that enable companies and NGOs, universities clearly, given their focus on research and governments, to find new approaches to share data while protecting privacy and get the mutual benefits of doing so. And there's a lot of work underway to do that. In part, it involves some tech companies like ours. We believe that's our future. We'd rather be in the business of selling the picks and shovels to help other people mine the gold than just go out and look for gold ourselves. Mm -hmm. But it's also governments that are making more data publicly available. Uh, it will take other regulatory regimes in place to help encourage a future where you don't see data just benefit the biggest companies and countries. So data sharing would become the new uh, name of the game, and uh, but the, the alternative would be for governments to simply nationalize and dismantle the big players. No, I'm joking. I, I wanted to scare you, but we're, we're discussing freely. <laughs> there, there are some really politicians here. who are not. So. <laughs> Yes, I, Amand, if I you want to add something. I, I want to agree strongly with uh, this aspect and bring a nuance on another one. Uh, we have to move from this focus on owning data to the use of data. Uh, I think, historically speaking, there's never been a single resource that's allowed a player or a set of players to accumulate power endlessly. You know, whether it's gold, land, whatever. I mean, land in economic terms has stayed on as something like a master resource. So we have to be careful about this notion of data, anthropologically speaking, historically speaking. At this point, you have a set of tools, machine learning in particular, that needs more and more data to work better and better. Mm -hmm. But there could be a disruption in as short a time as five years to that kind of a technology model. So I'll bring a caveat there, but I agree strongly that we have to move away to the use of data, to combining data sets from different fields, and not just public and private, so private companies and government data sets, but also data sets across different fields. Look at a company like Blue Dot, so which brings together data from the field of epidemiology and airline data to predict six months in advance that Zika would land up in a particular place in the United States. So that requires enabling. And you know, our headline today is Geneva win-win. Yes, we need to address the risks, but we also need to have platforms, win-win platforms, where data collaboration becomes possible but, across the globe. Amandeep, you're talking about scientific data, but what about the user's data monetized and used for marketing purposes by everyone, including even banks and, and big uh, platform, big internet platforms? What do we do with this data? You know, that has to be protected. Consumers have to have the trust that their data is being used responsibly. But that's one kind of data, the one that sits with Facebook and Twitter and so on. Right. But there are other kinds of data, and we need to work across domains and across borders. And there are areas we can start with. The security field is sensitive, I agree. Mm -hmm. Trade is sensitive. But health, for example, it's sufficiently global and it is not so global that it brings out all the geopolitical touchiness that you uh, see today. So start with small data sets, small problems in that area, and then iterate data governance out of the practice rather than imposing it in very abstract ways 
across the globe, it's not going to work. But uh, Doris, shouldn't governments invest more in infrastructure and put more money to, to get more stakes in those issues like 5G and where 5G is directly a requirement for artificial in intelligence to develop? So shouldn't uh, states manage to be more uh, stakeholders of a heavier weight in order to have their say? After all, isn't it about money and what you put in, in it also? Uh, apart from Switzerland, many governments, many countries are uh, very much in, indebted and uh, in difficulty for, for uh, managing to have enough resources to put in, in these developments of AI. And Google is more powerful than in many countries to invest in these sectors. I think what, what governments should do in the upcoming years is invest largely in education. I think uh, these are, well, in, in my generation, well, I did not grow up with a computer. I, when I was, I think, 18 or 19, I got my first uh, computer together with my brothers because it was not uh, normal that everybody has one of himself. So I think, uh, and, and, and a lot of in, in people in, with between 30 and 50 are now confronted with this new development and they have no knowledge. So I think companies must invest here in education as well as governments. This is for me in the next years uh, very important. And then I think, I hope that the Swiss government will also decide on the uh, new budget for the universities and uh, uh, also for, uh, for our professional trainings that they will, we will invest more money. We must, we must on big data, on uh, quantum computing, all these new technologies, we need a skilled labor force. And we must also here combine the social uh, questions with the, with the technical and business questions. And I think Switzerland is not too badly uh, positioned, but uh, it, it needs an additional investment. And then you can probably in a couple of years go to, a, a, let's say, normalization. And when it comes to infrastructure, I think, well, the government wanted to accelerate 5G not investment by government. In Switzerland, it's the private sector who uh, does this, uh, fortunately. But uh, you know, we know we have a lot of resistance against 5G because we, people have uh, anxieties about radiation. And I think here in Geneva, I see also quite a lot of resistance to 5G. Without 5G, you will never, you will never be smart enough to mm -hmm. have all this artificial intelligence here in Geneva. That's mm -hmm. a fact. So here we must also have more information, more trust, and then uh, companies will invest also in these uh, latest technologies and infrastructure. Thank you, great that you're mentioning education. So now I, I, I get the feeling that uh, the public wants to ask questions. They're here for this. Uh, but let me first give the word to Monsieur Pierre Modet, Uh, Monsieur le Conseil d'État en charge du développement économique, do you want to make remarks because you have been so much involved in the, the digital uh, uh, issues for Geneva? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me the floor to, to ask some questions and thank you to the, to the panel for your uh, very uh, pertinent views. But first of all, the title of today's uh, session is Can Geneva Make It a Win-Win uh, When It Comes to a Digital Cooperation? And my answer to that is a resounding yes. <laughs> but, but my answer to this question, you can say I am not necessarily the, the most objective guy to, to answer to this, uh, this question, but I happily assume. I want to say after, after uh, having heard you that in my view, the capacity is clearly here in Geneva. On all aspects on digital governance, Geneva is very well positioned. And this exceptional concentration of expertise has grown considerably since the last two years. Uh, two years ago, we met with Brad about the, the Geneva Digital Talks. Is that enough? Certainly not, and this leads me to my question. The high-level panel report makes a recommendation that by 2030, every adult should have affordable access to digital networks as well as digitally enabled financial and health services as a means to make a substantial contribution to achieving the SDGs 
the sustainable development goals. A call to adopt policies to support digital inclusion and digitally equality for women and traditionally marginalized groups is also made in the report. And my question, because SDG implementation is a key for Geneva, how close are we on these important targets? And what can we do in Geneva to accelerate the pace? Thank you very much. Thank you. Brad, you. Um, well, there's many things that can be done, and I would wholeheartedly endorse the important and indeed critical role that government needs to play with respect to education, because if government doesn't invest in education, no one else is going to save it. Um, but w one thing I would point out as well when we think about digital inclusion is the need to get technology into the hands of people. Um, it is not, I wholeheartedly agree, it's not sufficient, but it is necessary. And I think we should recognize that when we're talking about access to technology today, we're really talking about access at broadband speeds. Uh, so how do we do that? How does Geneva do that? Well, to me, we need to use support from governments to stimulate the market to pursue new technologies that will bring technology to more people faster and at lower cost. And if you really think about all communications-related technologies, and you look at the history of their diffusion in terms of reaching an entire population, there is one thing that stands out above all else. Anything that takes a wire is much more expensive and takes a lot longer than something that can be done wirelessly. Electricity required decades, in fact, we're not yet done as a planet in bringing electricity to everyone. It is extremely expensive because it relies on wires. The same was true of the landline telephone, for example. But think about radio, think about terrestrial television, think about cell phones, and while they're not yet globally ubiquitous, they all spread much more rapidly than these things that required wires. So when we think about broadband speeds for the internet, we can either ask governments to continue to invest in the most expensive approach, namely fiber optic cables to every home, or we can invest in that plus new technologies using additional spectrum in using what we call TV white spaces, the white spaces that are no longer being used that were used by terrestrial television. For those of us who grew up, say, before cable TV, maybe we're used to seeing an antenna on a roof or the rabbit ears on a television. Why did that work so well? The reason it worked so well is it used a part of the spectrum where Signals travel a long distance, they go over hills, they go through trees, they go through walls. And what we need, among other things, is to open up that spectrum, use public money in a much more limited and economical way to stimulate the adoption of the devices that will bring down the cost for everyone. And I think the more we can think about how governments can work together, spectrum is a public good, and target investment, we can really accelerate the market, and that's what we should try to do. Okay, thank you, Brad. We have uh, three questions waiting. Madam? So I'm Preeti Sana. I run financing for develop development ventures in Geneva. My question is, can data not be used to alleviate extreme poverty? I'm bringing in Geneva here. For instance, I'm looking at this article, take the positive side of Facebook. Facebook AI maps all of Africa. Take any region, I'm not pointing. But the point is, things like food, water, health, education, and housing. Let's take housing. Can we not map everybody who doesn't have affordable, decent housing, use that data, then get social enterprises to attack that problem? So that's my question. That's concrete uh, proposal. proposal it's, it's already being done. I mean, some of the houses being built for lower income families in parts of Asia, uh, their construction is now being monitored through satellite data. So that cuts down. Uh, uh, corruption helps you manage the projects at low cost. But I want to go back to the state councillor's question on Geneva's role. There's infrastructure, there's education, but I think Geneva, because of its neutrality, because of the trust that Geneva-based institutions have had, you know, we've had the humanitarian uh, initiatives, we've had other initiatives in the field of labor, 
health, education, the IB movement started here, the International Baccalaureate. Mm -hmm. So I think it is time to construct new platforms for collaboration, new win-win platforms in Geneva, which are trusted, which uh, enable collaboration around data. And uh, we are actually starting at the Graduate Institute today on one such platform in the area of digital health and AI research uh, with support from uh, the Geneva Science and Diplomacy Anticipated Foundation and the Botna Foundation. But we need many more of these, and these need to be done in an inclusive manner, just as in the 1950s, 60s, CERN came up. And there was a problem to be solved, and Geneva offered itself as a platform. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Brad talked about the digital convention, so that, that's the opportunity we should be looking at. Thank you, Amen. Uh, monsieur. Hello. Hello, my name is Nicola Shikhani. Uh, I am a banker and investor in startups. Um, first, thank you, Mr. Zaki, to see you every time at the Club Diplomatique. Uh, my question to the panel is the following. I mean, I heard everybody talking about ethics of data, about uh, data confidentiality, which is a main concern. How can organization, you know, act to guarantee this when governments, you know, create you know, rules and policies that oblige their own companies to give them data for between bracket security reason, uh, whatever the data is stored. And I'm referring to something that was uh, set up in the US called Cloud Act last year. Brad, you wanna take that? Well, I, I think that you point to a, both a critical policy issue and one that needs to re be addressed most importantly through diplomatic cooperation and agreements. Uh, every government wants, in certain circumstances, to get access to data about its citizens. If there's a public safety threat, of course, that definition varies around the world. If there's terrorism, if there's criminal activity. And yet we live in a world where more and more data is being stored, and governments are increasingly tempted to try to get data that resides in other countries. And I think the only way to resolve this for the long term is to have a new generation of international legal agreements. And specifically, one of the most important aspects of what's called the Cloud Act in the United States is that it created the legal foundation for the United States government to negotiate international agreements with other countries with rules that would allow access when needed, but under human rights and privacy safeguards. And what we urgently need is a set of agreements to emerge. We need the US government to move forward and start negotiating some of these bilaterally. We need some models or templates so that we then see multilateral agreements emerge. And until that happens, I think this whole area is just going to be not only more ripe for controversy and tensions between countries, but potentially evolving in a way that puts privacy at greater risk than it should be. Thank you for this realistic but very positive view. Monsieur Ufon. Thank you very much. My name is Daniel. I'm from Nigeria and a Graduate Institute alum. Thank you very much for the very compelling and convincing vision that you've painted, and thanks to the panelists as well. My question really looks at how this relates to the African continent. As a Nigerian citizen, I'm concerned that the continent will be the next frontier of cyberspace warfare, and that citizens, the internet, and governments will be targeted increasingly and have very reduced capability relative to other governments. And with that concern, I'm also slightly optimistic that companies such as Microsoft have taken some responsibility to try and change the world that they helped create. As, as you've said in your book, Brad, is a responsibility for technology companies. So I'm just curious about your observations on the African continent and how it's prepared to face some of those cybersecurity challenges and whether there's potential for rapid acceleration compared to some of its other development challenges. Thank you. Personally, I do think every day there's cause for optimism uh, about the future of Africa and the world of technology. And yeah, I think one needs to be realistic and recognize all the challenges. Uh, but the optimism needs to start with uh, uh, the opportunity to create the building blocks. Uh, some of it is the infrastructure. Um, you know, certainly Africa is connected to the world with high-speed fiber optic cables in a way that was not the case just a decade ago. 
Um, the year 2019 is noteworthy because we at Microsoft have, have really just opened the two first real hyperscale cloud data centers on the continent. They're both in South Africa, but they can serve the whole continent. Uh, we just opened you know, not one, but two major software development centers, one in Kenya and one in Nigeria, because of what we sense is just the, uh, the uh, growth in talent. Uh, and you know, talent that has not just great ability, but this enthusiasm to address these issues and to do what you described, really think about how to use new technology to leapfrog much of the rest of the world. I do think that when you look at the next 40 years, Africa actually is in some ways the most interesting continent because it is the one continent that is going to see clear growth in the population of people. And if it can find a way to harness that growing population and use technology to, to create this new generation of opportunities, then I look at, say, Africa in 2019, and I think of what it was like to go to, say, Southeast Asia in 1989, 30 years ago. And it was full of opportunity. You just didn't know whether the opportunity would be realized or not. Uh, it may, it may not, but I feel like the continent is closer today because of some of these things than it has been before. Okay, we'll, we'll take the next question. Sorry. Monsieur. Hi, thanks for a tremendous uh, discussion. Uh, my name is David Jensen. I work for the UN Environment Program. I'm about 60% optimistic on, the, on frontier technology and about 40% terrified. Um, but I work, on, I work on monitoring environmental security globally and how do we use frontier technology to do that. And to, to, to be effective, that's fundamentally about this cl uh, collaboration you mentioned between public sector and private sector partners. So I'm just wondering if you can, if you can articulate, perhaps, uh, Brad, the incentives that are going to be needed to get that collaboration moving and, and the kind of business models that would support that kind of collaboration and that kind of global scope for, for monitoring our planet. Thank you. Well, I'll try to be brief. I would say, one, we do need additional public sector incentives to stimulate the economy as a whole to pursue the kinds of data-based initiatives that will address you know, the fundamental uh, environmental challenges that the planet faces. And you know, let's face it, with the United States not you know, continuing to pursue the principles in the Paris Accord, uh, you know, life is more challenging than it was just a few years ago in this regard. But I do think, um, on the more heartening side, uh, you know, we are seeing across the private sector, we're seeing in you know, municipal and state governments in the United States a continuing commitment. And I think more and more we're finding businesses interested in using new technology in a way that you know, reduces energy costs and reduces, uh, as well, environmental externalities. And we're also discovering that, that AI and data are really a, a very potent tool uh, that can be put to work. So I might share the 60-40 split, but you know, the, I do see more, uh, more interest spreading actually quite quickly across our customers in using technology to address some of these issues in terms of their own work. Okay, maybe Doris, you want to add something? Well, I think uh, yes, with the US and climate change, it's a little bit difficult for the moment. And the cut was your, probably your budget for, for next year. But <laughs> um, I, I agree that digital technologies uh, can also help to improve our environmental situation. That's for sure. Like the uh, development area, they can profit. But at the end of the day, who, who takes the costs? Um, well, for example, plastic is for them uh, now a big movement and a big uh, challenge. Uh, when we could uh, collect plastic with uh, QR codes and have an overview and uh, incentivize uh, in developing business models, perfect. But who pays it? Who does it? So here we need a lot of collaboration, I think. And I see... Uh, not only in climate change, also here now, a lot of collaboration, a lot of initiatives which have the objective bringing people, organizations, experts, private, public sector together, because no one alone can solve it. Governments can't solve it. And therefore, I think the, the, the digital age is also an age of 
uh, much more collaboration and always with a multi-stakeholder approach. Difficult for governments because uh, nation states so far are used to decide alone. Thank you. So we had the very last question, but I'm told we don't have time anymore. We have to jump to the closing remarks now by Professor Jovan Kurbalija, head of the Geneva Internet Platform. Mr. Kurbalija, please come and join us at the floor here. Uh, you can take the microphone maybe and uh, make the closing remarks. I thank you all very much and uh, thank you, Mr. Kurbalija. Good evening. Uh, well, as you know, here in Geneva, there are attempts to have AI-driven uh, reporting by WIPO and few organizations, but till they develop the system that can create the reports from the events, you will have to stay with us human report, uh, uh, reporters. We had very rich discussion, and I would like to thank the, our panelists and the moderator for really a lot of insightful a uh, lot of insights. I will try to build these concluding remarks about a few metaphors. One metaphor uh, introduced by uh, Brad was uh, peeling layers of onion in understanding digital world. And this is important message, especially for students and researchers. Today we are living in the phase of, uh, let's say, hype, digital hype, moving to digital reality. For a long time, we were just hearing about blue sky narratives that we have just to walk and a bright future will, will happen. I grew up in the communist country in my early, early stage and it sounds like, like uh, that techno-driven optimism. Now people are asking questions. What is behind? What is distribution of power? What about our data? What about security? Therefore, this is one of the suggestions for students to pick up the research project thesis and to start peeling the layers of digital world, coming to some core issues, which Brad again uh, greatly stressed in his introdu introductory remarks. The world didn't start with our generation. Sometimes, and it's very human, we te tend to be chrononarcist. We think that everything is happening now and here. But even in Geneva, we in all over the world, but in particular in Geneva, we have a long history of attempts to uh, reconcile technology and humanity. Brad mentioned the roots of the ICRC, and when you analyze any international organizations in Geneva, you will find this technologically driven aspect, directly or indirectly. Therefore, we like to use the slogan that Geneva is the place where technology meets humanity. And I think it was one of the underlying messages uh, through our discussion. Then our discussion went to, uh, to the issue of uh, data. Well, it's, it's not surprising, data and AI. What was particularly useful in the remarks from the, our panelist, Amandi Pandoris, was attempt to declutter the notion of data. We tend to put and to use data as an ideological concept. But what we heard from our panelists, you have private data, you have scientific data, you have data as a global public good, you have a business data, and if we want to de-ideologize discussion on data, it is very important that we focus on specificities of data. It is a different regulation of data in CERN, which is coming from the tunnel, from the experiments, from the private data or data managed by WMO. This was one of the underlying messages, and I think it was, for me personally, one of the most important messages from discussion that, that, that we had. Then we went to the question of economy of data, data as a public good, a lot of interest, interesting topics for students for their PhD and MA thesis here at the Graduate Institute. Uh, there was an interesting, very important uh, notion from Amandip that it is not enough to provide cables. For a long, long time, techno-deterministic approach was focusing basically more computers, more development, more human happiness. We are realizing that it is not the case. Inclusiveness requires more other aspects, economic, social, cultural, and the very human, personal, sometimes even spiritual. Therefore, we have to approach this issue in the broader, in the broader context. Then, uh, the, uh, Brad brought us to the, gave us a reality check, in a sense that we need a rules to govern the digital space. 
with the national rules, international rules, and very practical suggestion. US government got mandate from the Cloud Act to negotiate international agreements. They're negotiating bilateral agreements. But how the multilateralism started? When people realize that it's, e it's easier for a few countries to get together and to negotiate multilateral treaty instead of bilateral treaties. This is how ITU started. They realized that it was difficult to negotiate bilateral tele telegraph uh, conventions and they created international, international organizations. We had the references to the question of uh, CERN. Uh, we had the uh, uh, references to the, to the one important issue development in Africa. And here is uh, what is, what is uh, important to keep in time. I completely share Brad's indication that Africa is a space of optimism and growth. But currently, we have to recognize the reality. And that will give you one statistics, which was really uh, difficult to swallow and digest. Only 5% of articles about Africa on Wikipedia are written by Africans. Only 5%. The starting position is relatively, relatively low. A lot has to be done to, 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 to improve, improve that. We had a quite a insightful indication about education, about health, as areas of relatively low-hanging fruits where people are concerned globally, and when we can have initiatives with a with with high, high impact. Uh, one point which was mentioned initially, and uh, I will add it, I won't report, I will use the, the prerogative of a rapporteur to add one point which is extremely important for Geneva, and which we noticed, Doris Amandip and myself, during the work in the panel. Very often people ask very simple question whom I should call to address my digital problems. On individual levels, on company level, on level of institutions like Graduate Institute, governments. And very often there are places where you can address digital problems. But there is, not, there is no awareness or the problems are multidisciplinary. Therefore, that element of help desk that we introduce in the panel is extremely important. And many help desks could be established international organization and places in, in Geneva. It is, it is a relatively simple activity, but it can address the level of, increase the level of trust, reduce the level of confusion. Just pointing where the governments can go to, for example, get the help with the law on the, on the child safety. Finally, uh, I would like to conclude with one initiative which is starting in, at, uh, here in Geneva. It is initiative of AI drafting of the social contracts for future. We will invite companies worldwide and researchers by providing them with a corpus of human knowledge from app of, of Gil, uh, Gilgamesh, Bible, Rousseau's, Voltaire's writing to give us advice on 10 pages what would be ideal digital con social contract. And it could be great opportunity for institutions in Geneva, academic research and other actors. And I will conclude with the discussion on optimism. It started with the quantification 60-40%, but uh, what really uh, was impressive from the panel members uh, was notion of informed optimism. We have to recognize reality, we have to know the constraints, but we shouldn't underestimate possibilities that digital technology offer ahead of us. And in realizing that informed optimism approach, Geneva can play an extremely important role. Thank you. Thank you, Jovan. So, ladies and gentlemen, multilateralism is, may not be welcome in today's international relations, but multilateralism cooperation is surely the way to go when it comes to the digital world. Uh, and Geneva uh, looks to be the place for digital diplomacy. We thank you very much for your participation. Thank you to the panelists for the wonderful uh, interventions. Uh, we're now closing this event and we wish you a good evening. Thank you.